this upcoming uh, few moments, I would like to present you the PhD work of mine of the last two years. So my name is Dora Koch. I'm a pediatric resident in the Tuzoto Street Department of uh, Semmelweis University. And I'm also a PhD student, surprisingly. And uh, one day I would like to be a pediatric hematologist specialist. And therefore, I would like to achieve the best therapeutic effect with the lowest possible toxicity when treating these children. And uh, we want to prevent severe toxicity during anti-cancer treatment. So here are just a list briefly about my running projects. Um, and I would like to tell the details in these upcoming few moments or minutes. So in our first project, we went through the literature looking for some possible data in connection with a quite debating uh, outcome, which is increased in induced peripheral neuropathy. And uh, therefore, we uh, uh, did this meta-analysis. So why are we investigating this drug? Uh, we are administering it since 1960s, and uh, it is considered the most effective anti-leukemic drug. Uh, also in pediatric malignancies and adult malignancies as well, so it's widely used. And almost every three patient who is treated with this drug are affected by this special uh, adverse, event, adverse event, which is neurotoxicity. And um, if we think about uh, uh, these children and adults, they not only have to struggle with a mortal disease, but uh, they have to fight with the adverse events of uh, different chemotherapy protocols and uh, treatments. So uh, toxicity is always a, um, a hot topic in oncology. So we found that in the case of other uh, chemotherapeutical agents, if we prolong the administration, it can result in decreased toxicity with uh, the same therapeutic effectiveness. So our question was that what is in the case of vincristine? if uh, does the prolongation reduce the toxicity? This was the research question of ours, and we hypothesized that, yes, the prolongation can reduce the neurotoxicity especially. So this was the research question, and we examined this in um, oncological patients treated with Christine, adults and children as well. And uh, we tried to find publications which contain information about uh, the continuous administration and the conventional bolus injection form. And when Christine induced neurotoxicity, the incidence of neurotoxicity was uh, evaluated. And here you can see the uh, process of the selection. And here I have to note that uh, we couldn't find, unfortunately, just one uh, article which compared the two administration routes, uh, the one hour long infusion with the bolus injection so we had to add other respect to our study uh, to analyze uh, the outcome. Um, so here you can see the overall neurotoxicity incidences um, in two, we can say, subgroups. So in the continuous group and the push group, uh, these were mainly single arm studies, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we could see that there was a 37% uh, in the continuous group, the overall neurotoxicity rate and uh, and 39 in the push group. Uh, we examined uh, the severe neurotoxicity in a different way, or, or the same way, but in different groups. Uh, so the continuous uh, uh, prevalent, uh, in the continuous group, 3% um, of the patient, uh, patients experienced severe neurotoxicity, and in the push group, it was 6%. And we analyzed deeply the question of severe neurotoxicity and we could found that here the first proportion belongs to the uh, push injection group. Uh, so the 6% I've already showed you. And this other subgroup uh, with the 32% uh, is the group of uh, when azoles, so uh, antifungal agents were co-administered with vincristine. This is a very well-known pharmacokinetic um, uh, thing that um, uh, azoles has effect on uh, vincristine elimination. So this is why we have chosen this subgroup and we found that this is, and here just to present the uh, other effects of chemos on severe neurotoxicity, and we found this relation significant. So ASOS has significant effect on neurotoxicity. Uh, here uh, in the case of chemos, we analyzed plenty of chemotherapies uh, which could have effect on neurotoxicity, but only in the case of bortezomibe could a uh, really uh, higher rate could be seen. Uh, surprisingly, there was a difference between uh, solid and hematologic malignancies. 
the rate of neurotoxicity was higher in yeah. hematologic malignancies. So just some con conclusions. So uh, we couldn't find any clear evidence uh, still in connection with the administration types of this drug, but azo antifungals have a significant effect of neurotoxicity. And um, bortezomib, uh, in the case of bortezomib, we could see a tendency in neurotoxic higher neurotoxicity, but the other chemos uh, had no effect on neurotoxicity, we can say, or no significant effect. And uh, there was a tendency in malignancy types. So we still have the hope if we prolong the administration, we can prevent uh, neurotoxicity. Um, in chemotherapies are safe to use with vincristine, we can say. Uh, for example, in elasparginase, it's always a debating topic um, uh, what could happen. Uh, in uh, this case, uh, in the case of ASOS, uh, we have administration guidelines, which these articles we, uh, uh, we included uh, in our analysis. Uh, they use uh, guidelines how to administer ASOS uh, when it's concomitantly administered with vincristine, but these guidelines need revision because severe neurotoxicity is still really prevalent. And uh, we need some randomized trials uh, to compare uh, uh, these administration routes. The, manuscript is still under writing. And here we performed a comparative study because of we couldn't find any conclusion uh, based on the literature. So we are we initiated a pilot phase of an RCT comparing the prolonged administration with the conventional push injection. Uh, and we added a pharmacokinetic observation to this uh, comparison. So we suppose, or our question was that uh, the three hour, uh, does the prolonged three hour long um, continuous increase in infusion uh, reduce the toxicity or uh, the severity of adverse events uh, compared to the conventional administration? We tested or we are investigating this in uh, children uh, diagnosed with hematologic malignancies. These are the intervention and the comparison uh, what we investigate and increasing in use peripheral neuropathy is the outcome. So hopefully uh, our hypothesis is that it reduces the severity and we can uh, hopefully find a decrease in toxicity levels. Here you can see the treatment protocol, uh, which is used currently, not currently, now we are using the ALIC BFM uh, 2022 already, but when we started the pilot, it was this uh, protocol, which we, we, we are used. This is the induction therapy. Uh, so the, the initiation of uh, ALL uh, treatment. Here are the conventional uh, and the investigation uh, or the uh, arm which we are investigating. These are the days of the ALIC protocol when vincristine is administered. And we are firstly uh, doing a pharmacokinetic measurement on the first, when the first administered dose is, uh, and the first vincristine dose is administered. And these um, samples are already uh, used for population pharmacokinetic analysis as well. And if we have the human resource, then we are collecting uh, blood samples on the force uh, increased in administration uh, day as well. And we have neurological examinations before and after increased in administration. So before uh, the eighth day of the uh, induction therapy and after, 7, 14 days uh, from, from the force administered vincristine dose. So as already mentioned, neurotoxicity is evaluated uh, primarily with the gold standard method of oncology, the common terminology criteria of adverse events grading system. And we chose to evaluate it with the gold standard uh, method for peripheral neuropathies, which is nerve conduction studies. So we, we, if we have additional consent, we also uh, perform this examination as well. Uh, these are the uh, CTCA terms referring to increased in neurotoxicity based on the literature. So we decided to use these terms uh, and calculate an overall CTCA score from these um, different terms. Uh, we are running our uh, um, pilot in two uh, training centers. We have already 30 included patients and uh, two, more than 200 collected blood samples. Um, so here are just some baseline data of the already included patients. The mean age is around five, more boys are included now and uh, 
16 patients are on the continuous infusion arm. Here are just some really, really preliminary results of the CTCA neurotoxicity grading and the means of the grading points, which we calculated. And you can see that a little bit higher a mean could be found in the, the uh, push injection group. Uh, but I have to note that this really severe um, uh, adverse effects uh, here in, uh, with, uh, with red occurred only in the push group. So the posterior reversible uh, leukoencephalopathy syndrome, prolytic ileus, ileus and uh, central nerve involvement. And of course, a lot of data uh, have been collected and it's under data cleaning and analysis. So we submitted our protocol first. Uh, and now we are planning to submit uh, then our pilot results as well, but it's still under data cleaning. And I have another project as well in which we are effect uh, investigating the late effects of anti-cancer therapy, uh, especially the neurotoxicity. So uh, sometimes vincristine induced neuropathy persists after uh, intensive chemotherapy, uh, uh, especially maintenance therapy, but after that as well we can see uh, neuropathic symptoms and we are using this uh, neurometer uh, very well known in diabetic care to uh, assess uh, late neurotoxicity in patients. And we are also collecting retrospective data um, with the, from the included patients about their uh, therapeutic uh, or therapy related data. So it, it's a cross-sectional study. We have already included 40 patients. Uh, the late neuropathy assessment is done by this instrument, and uh, we uh, initiated a late toxicity database um, near this um, um, investigation on the REDCAP uh, database system. And just a few words about additional activities. So these three are in connection with my work, and but. I think life is not just work, so I have just uh, uh, here on, a, uh, on other activities. I like to sport. I really like CrossFit. So this is the picture of uh, really hard exercise there and running as well. So thank you very much for your attention and um, sorry again for the uh, for my little bit stronger presentation and for these disturbances here in the beginning. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. I have uh, some basic questions. The first is, what is the prescription of giving this uh, drug uh, in the protocol, in the original protocol? Is it a push or is it not specific? The, the conventional one is a push uh, injection form. So for 40 years, we have given this drug in a push injection form. And this, first of all, this was for practical reasons because in the initiation of chemotherapy, we didn't have central line catheters. And um, uh, the risk of paralyzation when giving uh, something in a, in a push injection form is lower than in an infusion, for example, of three hours. So it needs, if it's administered in, but it's not, but if it's administered in peripheral lines, then it, it needs constant monitoring if uh, no paralyzation occurs. So second, this is the, the reason behind that. The second that. question is if, it, if the standard uh, procedure is the push, whether a continuous in fact, uh, infusion has the same uh, medical effect, because maybe the side effects are lower, but whether it is uh, also as effective as a push, because uh, we don't know whether the, the high level is working or, or a continuous uh, lower but long level is working. Is there any day? data about this? Uh, uh, our, yes, this was our first one at the first when we initiated this, but uh, we could find studies. It, it was, um, so our observation was based on pharmacokinetic um, uh, parameters and uh, uh, these studies who, which uh, explored the pharmacokinetic um, parameters of a continuous increase in infusion, they concluded that with these parameters and everything, the efficacy could be the same. So the, they assess the uh, efficacy as well. And this is, the, these are, um, for, I don't know how many studies, but they concluded the same. This is why we uh, initiated this, that, okay, this could be the same, uh, eff effective. And to change something in the protocol, you also need ethical uh, yes. uh, allowance. So do you have an ethical commission decision about this? Yeah, we uh, in our, uh, you mean the RCT? 
Yes, we, uh, everything was started with a QCAB uh, ethical approval. We already got this last year. This is when uh, we started this pilot phase in 2022 March. So we already had this ethical approval, but the protocol was now uh, submitted. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, very nice data. And the first part of your presentation, you mentioned that the neurotoxicity is different according to the etiology. I mean, different for hematologic and other yes. disease. But the uh, treatment strategy for Vincristine is the same. I mean, the dosage and... Yes, it's it's a great question. Uh, uh, in, for example, in hematologic malignancies, as you can see here in the articles, uh, yes, there was a. We can see that it's the neurotoxicity occurs in a wide spectrum, and this is why these are mainly um, adult um, data. And in adult hematology, uh, the treatment is not always protocolized. So in, in children, we are using this alid BFM protocol and it, the therapeutic ef, uh, effect is always detected, but every children gets the whole treatment protocol. No, I'm not sure for that. So, sorry. Uh, and if you compare solid tumors, the protocol for increased is different for hematologic disorders, I guess. Uh, yes. But it, it, I would like to highlight the cum cumulative dose. Uh, uh, the importance of the cumulative dose. So uh, in, in hematologic malignancies, we uh, administer more of pinchristine because it is considered to be the most um, effective antileukemic drug. And we consider it eight times, for example, during the ALA treatment. And it varies in uh, the, the, um, the solid tumors. So maybe uh, we concluded that it could be because of the uh, cumulative dose. Congratulations for your nice presentation and also for organizing a randomized control trial, which is, I think, extremely difficult in, in, ch in children. Uh, so my question is, how, what is your experience? Um, how the parents and the children are willing to uh, participate in, uh, in a trial like this? Uh, thank you for your question. So it's uh, quite interesting because, uh, as you could see, we use two evaluation methods um, uh, regarding to neurotoxicity, so the CTCA grading and the nerve conduction studies. And the uh, two uh, main reasons why they reject participating in the study is one of is the randomization. Because when we tell them what are the good things about the uh, three-hour-long infusion, they always want to get in this arm. But we have to say that this is not our decision. This is randomized. And they say, oh, that, that's, that's not what we like. And the other thing is the nerve conduction study. Because we have to tell them that it's, it's bad. So it hurts. And uh, we can get really good clinical data from it. Uh, but it hurts. And if... Uh, Mainly in, in teenagers, they uh, in this um, phase of life they reject it immediately. So these are this is a hard uh, life phase we can say, and uh, also without ALL diagnosis, and they get the diagnosis of an ALL. So this whole psychological mess is going on, and you want to uh, do nerve conductions uh, on them. It's it's not that. <laughs> easy and uh, they have a stronger opinion saying no to their parents and reject the participation. Uh, we always say that um, it could be good clinically if we test it before administering Vincristine because uh, there is a familial neuropathy called charcot marie tooth disease and uh, we can, uh, it, and sometimes it is subclinical, and we can see the deterioration of the nerve conduction parameters already. But we have don't we don't have any clinical presentation uh, in this time point. But when we are administering a drug which causes neurotoxicity, we expect that they 100% sure we are 100% sure that neurotoxicity will occur. And for it's a good question how we can modify our treatment protocol based on that uh, um, information because induction therapy is quite critical, but, uh, but this is what we tell them and they uh, maybe uh, accept more this thing. So these are the experiences. <laughs>
congratulations on your presentation as well as well as your trial because I know how much effort and quality you didn't bring and will bring not just in Summerlays but in, in Time Pal as well. My question is regarding the others. Uh, I was wondering all the others um, are the same and what will you recommend at the revision of the azor therapy? Yes, good question. Uh, yeah, the uh, effect of azos depends on how strong in inhibitors they are of the uh, CIP3A4 enzyme. And uh, some of them are just uh, competitive inhibitors of the enzyme. Some of them are stronger. And uh, maybe the recommendation or the, the uh, least strong uh, uh, inhibitor is fluconazole. But the spectrum of fluconazole is not the best. So, for example, in high-risk patients, we use voriconazole prophylaxis, but it's a much more stronger inhibitor of the enzyme. So maybe um, fungins can be uh, the solution of this problem. So I would like to ask that in uh, your first study, we, we see that a uh, lot of uh, nice red bars. So the prediction intervals, what, what are the meaning of the prediction intervals in your meta-analysis? Um, if uh, we, so the pre prediction interval shows you that if you find another study, the outcome will occur uh, in this range, what you have in the prediction interval. Thank you. And I have an additional question that um, in your first study, you said that something has a significant effect. And this was about uh, proportions. How you define this significance effect? Or it was not clear for me. So uh, it was made to be, uh, there was a proportion for the uh, uh, push group, this 6%, and there was the proportion of the ASO subgroup, which was 32%, and the confidence intervals that didn't interfere, or how, what is the correct word? This is how we could calculate this uh, significance level. Thank you for the presentation. Um, the question would be, you have talked about for us how difficult it is that when they hear that how painful it is, they don't really want to participate. Do you have a rough number how many of the patients are eligible but decline to participate by any chance? Uh, I can say that uh, we already included uh, 30 patients and only 10 accepted uh, to do the nerve conduction studies. And the third project, the cross-sectional cross one, um, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, could you elaborate on that by any chance? Um, yes. So you are uh, curious about the inclusion criteria, what we have? Yes, the inclusion criteria. Uh, yes, these are mainly children, but also adults who uh, are coming back to our hospitals and were treated with a hematologic malignancy, uh, not all, but acute lymphoid leukemia and Hodgkin's disease. And they are coming back to their regular follow-up meetings after treatment. So one year after um, uh, completing the chemotherapy plus maintenance therapy, two, three, et cetera, until 10 years. And this is how we are. Uh, they are coming in one day, Wednesday, and we are doing the examinations on that day. So it's for all of them, they start at the one year point or like it's not different times since their treatment has been started. Uh, it is different times because uh, you, you know that um, they... Uh, so they are dif in different times after treatment. So the initiation date was also um, different. Oh, I mean, them. the amount of months that has been paused from the initial starting of collection of data and uh, the treatment. So whether you are accounting for that difference or if there is a difference yes, at all. Yes, we are counting for that. Yes, thank you. Okay.